Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Since the onset of the current administration, the performance of the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment could best be described as a mixed bag of success and mixed opportunities. From celebrating Nigeria's jump by 24 places on the World Bank Ease of Doing Business report in 2017, the country deviated from its target to continue to climb on the index by dropping a spot in the 2018 report released by the World Bank. A number of reasons have been adduced for the country's inability to achieve its set target. The absence of critical infrastructure, access to cheap credit, policy flip-flops and bureaucratic bottlenecks continue to serve as a disincentive to investors seeking to invest in Nigeria. Add to this Nigeria's refusal to become a signatory to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in March last year, which got many wondering why Africa's largest economy was shying away from the continental trade deal. Joining us this morning to speak on what it would take to make Nigeria an industrial hub, competitive and an attractive investment destination is the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Dr. Okechuku Enelama. Good morning, sir. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Let's start with our ranking on the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. After celebrating Nigeria's improvement on the index by 24 places in 2017, the country fell by one place last year, effectively missing the federal government's <laughs> target to keep improving the country's ranking on the index. What accounted for this drop in 2018? Thank you for that question. I think the starting point is um, to acknowledge that the whole theme of enabling environment and making it easier to do a business in our country is one that we should and ought to have paid attention to for a long time. Before this government came in, for 10 years or so, we kept dropping in the rankings. I mean, we're actually in the top 100 about 2006 or so. But from 2006 to 2015, we had dropped to 169th, even 170th, you know, so we as a government made it a priority that that reversal has to stop and we have to move forward. And to the credit of our president, President Buhari, he launched a council, commissioned a council, the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, to oversee all the efforts of government working with the private sector and other stakeholders to make it easier to do business in our country. Just one of the dimensions of that, one indicator of success, is what the World Bank measures, the so-called World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index. And we, we were quite gratified and happy that it, um, <clears throat> the first year of our efforts resulted in a very significant jump, like you said, 24 places. And as you know, as happens in these things, when you have such rapid gains, you need to consolidate those gains and then move forward. I am fully persuaded that the forward movement will continue. Uh, for some reason last year, a lot of the improvements we are making and we made last year were not yet recognized by the World Bank because they felt they had not been bedded down. And in any event, I think the most important message to leave with our people is that this is a joint effort. You know, everybody benefits if it's easier to do business in Nigeria. So the private sector, the government, the um, small businesses, which by the way, is what the measurement of the World Bank um, um, index focuses on. It focuses on ease of doing business for small businesses. So um, there's a lot that is going on there, and I'll be happy to share more with you as we go on. You will. Well, in your capacity as the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, you are also the Vice Chairman of the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council, which was set up two years ago to improve on and create the enabling environment for businesses to thrive in the country. Now, what would you say are the major accomplishments of that council? Well, I think the major accomplishments of the council can be divided into a number of parts. One is just making it easier to do business in our country. Let's start with what the World Bank measures. World Bank measures um, the life cycle of a typical small business, from how it gets, obtains registration. It is now easy to register businesses in Nigeria within 24 hours, maximum 48 hours. In fact, in a matter of hours in many cases, by the Corporate Affairs Commission, um, uh, we've automated um, the way businesses pay their taxes. We made it a lot easier to obtain credit. Um, the uh, National Assembly passed two notable laws that make it easier for small businesses to obtain credit all in the life of this administration. We are working with the states to make it easier to obtain 
property in the state and to register property. You know, so all the things that are required to make it easier for businesses to run, we have done. So that's one dimension, what the World Bank measures. We are also working on things that affect the way people do business in our country, particularly investors coming in. You would have heard of basic services like visa on arrival, <coughs> you know, and trying to ensure that like if somebody wanted to get a visa to come to Nigeria, within 48 hours, our missions will issue such a visa to such a person. These things look ordinary, but honestly, they are the things other countries have done and we are now doing to make our country attractive. You will also remember that the president um, and the acting president at the time passed an executive order, you know, the executive order 001 on transparency, the principle of one government and, and, um, and also making it easier to do business in the country, including something called deemed approvals. All those are geared towards making it easier to do business in our country. And my sense is that you'll find that things will get better. These are, these are things which, when you start doing them, there may be a bit of heavy lifting initially, which is what we've done. But as we go on, you'll find that things will get progressively easier. The important thing is that we have to continue to make it a priority. Okay. There is no question, and I've been in business for a long time, Dr. that Le the singular most important priority Great. in making it easier to do is Dr. It's Le Lama, let me, let me just button businesses. here. Um, because the council set out seven priorities to target, out of which four are yet to be met, and they include uh, registration of property, um, getting credit, power supply. How do you intend to grow businesses if you know we cannot meet uh, the expectations of investment? Uh, prospective businesses cannot be granted regular power supply, the sanctity of contracts, or even to get access to cheap credits. So, I mean, let's just use the examples you used. In all those examples, there have been positive movements. So if you look at getting credit, I told you that two laws have been passed that make it easier to get credit. The Bank of Industry has been providing credit. We have also the social intervention funds for the artisans, people in the informal sector. And so I think in terms of getting credit, there is absolutely no question that like um, a lot has been done, a lot is being done. When you look at the issue of property, the key is making it easier to uh, register property at the state level. And we're working with the states in that regard. And that's uh, one of the priorities of the Presidential Enabling Business and Environment Council right now, to work with the states to make it easier you know, to um, register property, and, and to do, deal with things that involve real estate at the state level. Because as you know, property really is mostly handled at the state level. But those two laws, uh, Minister, have not been effective. They are ineffective. Yes, they have been passed, but what about impl implementation? We are yet to see businesses come forward with collaterals. Well, uh, um, you know, the laws, there are two sides to the, there are two sides to the laws. One has to do with um, having a, a, a credit registry, right, that enables people have a trade, a credit track record. And if you look at that um, collateral registry and the credit um, registry, what you will find is that like um, a lot of people have been registering, a lot of businesses have registered. I think we have over upwards of 600,000, if not more, that have been registered. So obviously the credit history will develop over time. If you look at the uh, movable collateral bill or the movable collateral law, which basically says you can obtain um, credit using um, movable property, not just landed property. I think also um, the important thing is the point you made earlier that like increasingly we are making it easier to access credit for, for SMEs, for small and medium enterprises. It won't all happen in one swoop, but I think before you actually comment on that, you actually need to do some research and get the information. My view is that there is a lot that is going on. If you talk to, we were at the Presidential Quarterly Business Forum yesterday, and Bank of Industry pointed out they have given over 500 billion Naira worth of credit over the last three years, and a significant part of that went to SMEs. So most of the time when things are going well in terms of credit, it's not like people come and scream and announce it, but I do believe that there is positive movement. There's also the issue of land matters. Beyond Lagos and the Federal Capital Territory, which have digitized their land registries, other states continue to place a plethora of bottlenecks to land registration and allocation. We know that the issue of land allocation falls under the purview of the states, but what has your ministry done to reach out to the states to encourage them to improve the process of land acquisition and registration? You make a very important point that the way to go is technology, leverage technology, you know, basically by using um, um, a technology to an automation. 
make it easier to obtain those services. And you give the example of Lagos State and Federal Capital Authority. As you know, what happens in Nigeria is that as you have those improvements, other states copy. So I think you will see increasingly that um, other states are following suit. Let me also uh, answer your related question, which is what we are doing. And the President Enabling Business Environment Council and the Secretariat, Enabling Business Environment Secretariat, um, have been right in terms of ease of doing business and it creates a positive tension for the states to do better and so far I think uh, many of states have embraced this opportunity the secretariat um, has been to many of the states in the country and a lot of it is around making it easier to do business at the state level automation being a big part of that well what about the access to right of way well this is another area prospective investors in the telecommunication sector have complained about they have found it increasingly difficult to roll out their fiber cables along the big cities of Lagos and Abuja, and this has hampered the deployment of broadband access to smaller towns and several state capitals in the country. Thank you for bringing that up. That's also an area where I think um, a lot of work is going on, although you may not be fully aware of this work. Um, one of the other important initiatives that the president launched is the Nigeria Industrial Policy and Competitiveness Advisory Council, which is basically a partnership between senior members of government and the private sector working together to um, further industrialization in the country. And it turns out that um, one dimension of that work is critical infrastructure. In dealing with the critical infrastructure, we dealt with the issue of right of way, particularly for you know, people who provide broadband access and other things that uh, telecom services that require right of way. And we actually have engaged the states and um, uh, the good news is that the states, um, through six representatives of the six geopolitical zones, have committed to work with us to harmonize and make it easier to get right of way, you know, so that to make sure there's a basic fee that you pay across the country in every state, and also to ensure that that right of way is made um, increasingly easier. In return, the telecom companies have committed to uh, aggressively deploy uh, technology across all the states and improve broadband access and um, the data access. So I think it's a win-win, and you will see that being rolled out in 2019. So I think you'll find that, again, that's one where there's been a lot of progress, working with the states. Mm. Um, and the Industrial Council is the one championing this initiative. So are you in agreement with the sub-national report from the 36 states that has called for a proactive approach, whereby state governments implement federal reform initiatives in centrally regulated areas, but also would design and implement their own reforms in areas under state authority? Um, the, the, the short answer is yes, but I need to explain why it's yes. I think the important thing to note is that these things don't happen automatically, and they don't happen by just issuing a directive or some kind of law. I think what happens is the example I give you of what the Industrial Policy and Competitiveness Advisory Council is doing, which is where you have a group of people, particularly when it's a partnership between government and private sector, engaging the states, engaging the federal government, and working together in partnership, in harmony, in collaboration, to basically produce results that are win, win, win. That is win for the states, win for the federal government, win for the stakeholders. Um, you just give the example of right of way. That's exactly what's happening there. And just to then reinforce your second, the second uh, point you made, uh, this thing should not stop the states from continuing with their own reforms at the, at the state level. So the fact that there are certain reforms that should cut across the entire country and therefore we should work collaboratively across and with the states should not stop individual states from continuing to pursue reforms and, and progressive um, um, interventions that will make things, business, uh, work better in their states and life better for their citizens. Now, after rising in 2017 and in the first quarter of 2018, capital importation into the country, including foreign direct investment, fell in the two succeeding quarters of last year, that's Q2 and Q3. Isn't this a sign of loss of confidence in the economy among foreign investors? Um, I don't think so. First, let me say that um, we've done a lot, um, particularly working with the Nigeria Investment Promotion Commission to um, make it more and more attractive for investors to come in. Let's start with the things we've done for existing investors. As you know, the general rule or what works best, uh, wisdom demands that you first take care of what you have and then you look out to bring more in. So what we're doing with the existing investors in the country is very important. And for them, there were two areas they wanted to see interventions and the government has really 
done uh, the, the work there. One is pioneer status incentive scheme. In other words, as they're investing, they want to be given tax holidays for that. And um, this was suspended before we came in. We've now revamped it, restored it, and streamlined it. So it's working very well. And I think if you talk to businesses, they'll tell you so. The second one was the export expansion grant for those that want to export and grow their businesses beyond the Nigerian market. We've also restored that, revamped it, and streamlined it. If you talk to investors and businesses, they'll tell you that. You then come to the point of new investors, both foreign direct investors and foreign portfolio investors and domestic investors. One of the important measures of that is the commitments they make. Because the way investors work, they work in stages. The first thing is that they come and visit or they come and um, identify and assess the opportunity. Then they make a commitment to invest. Then they eventually deploy the capital. If you look at the commitments investors made in 2017, it was over $60 billion. That's announced investments. Uh, NIPC, Nigeria Investment Promotion Commission, monitors this. In 2018, it jumped to over, sorry, yes, 2018, it jumped to over $70 billion. Now, depending on the nature of the investment, and I'll use one example, it may not always come in as quickly as you would like. For instance, when the president went to China for the um, um, FUCAC, which is basically the, the cooperation between the African countries and China, you know, we met with a group called the Ruyu Group. They announced an investment of $2 billion. They're still doing the work. And until they complete that work, you may not see the capital actually flowing. So you need to monitor, particularly when it comes to foreign direct investment, the commitments and the work people are doing before you eventually get to the actual flows. And the actual flows may actually happen over time because that's what wise investors do. They don't bring the money in one swoop. The final thing to say is that you also know that investors do get somewhat um, circumspect when elections are approaching. So it's not necessarily um, unusual for you to see some kind of slowdown just before an election and then an upswing after the election. Um, so you will see some of that as well. But obviously what we're encouraging investors to do is to see the track record of Nigeria in terms of conducting elections. So far, so good. Well, that's um, a lot on foreign, invest, foreign direct investments. Let's look now at trade. After Nigeria pulled out of signing the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, it set up a committee last October to review the potential costs and the impact of that agreement. What were the findings of the committee, and is the federal government still adamant about remaining out of that continental trade deal, even after South Africa eventually became a signatory to the agreement? Thank you. Thank you for bringing up the matter of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. First, let me make um, a correction. You know, Nigeria did not pull out. Quite to the contrary, we actually were very involved in the work that led up to uh, the signing of the agreement or the ratification of the agreement by some of the members in, in, um, in uh, March 27, 2018. Uh, the point is that, like, the way it was set up, if you know, if you follow the story of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which is the, called AFCFTA for short, it was that, like, the, the African Summit, which is the heads of government and heads of state of African Union, basically agreed that this was a good thing to do and that they will sign a framework agreement to kick off the process. Now, in the case of Nigeria, having done that work in terms of understanding that framework agreement and getting ready for the heads of government to sign, um, some of our stakeholders, rightly so, pointed out that they wanted to be more involved in the process prior to the ratification beyond what will happen after the ratification. Because the, the way the uh, AFCFTA was set up was that you are, going to, you are going to have one year following the ratification by the heads of government, right, for you to go and consult locally. And with the benefit of hindsight, Nigeria actually did it the right way. So we decided to do it the other way. Remember that like, it's not a one-off opportunity that where if you don't sign by March or April 2018, you can't sign the agreement. The agreement is going to be a 1,500-year agreement. It's like the EU agreement. You know? So it's going to last for a very long time. The only point we made was that, like, given the level of interest and engagement of the Nigerian private sector, of the Nigerian state's governors, of the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, and a number of other players, we decided to pause engage them, explain the agreement, understand it, do some impact studies, and then eventually proceed on the basis of that. And I believe that our work, which is now coming to um, a, a successful conclusion, will lead to Nigeria going ahead to uh, support the agreement, but then with our own stakeholders having been carried along. We, again, like I said yesterday, we had a presidential quarterly business forum, and the business community that were gathered appreciated the government for taking the post and respecting them and going through that process. And um, this is a case where, you know, we decided to slow things down so that we'll have more buy-in, so that it's not a matter of speed. It's a matter of really 
uh, traveling with others. You know the way they say, if you want to travel, uh, is it um, if you want to travel fast, you travel alone. But if you want to really get the results you are looking for, you then slow down and make sure you carry other people along. So that's what Nigeria has done, and I believe that the benefits will show in the in the fullness of time. All right. So are you saying that the committee has not completed its work, and when can Nigerians hope that? this committee will eventually complete its work? That work is being completed. I think it's going to be completed, um, I believe, this month. I mean, that work was, they were given three months. Uh, the president gave us three months. I'm a co-chair of the committee doing the impact assessment uh, studies. And um, the, from the feedback I have, that work is going to be com com completed imminently. Then that report will be passed to the president. And I believe that the president will then, on the basis of that, uh, advise us and direct us on how to make sure that Nigeria gets the full benefit of, um, of um, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which, as you know, having been, um, should I say, um, signed by um, a majority of African countries, is now waiting for ratification by 22 of those countries to go into effect. So really, what we're talking about is how to work within an AFCFT environment, not whether AFCFT will come into force. It will definitely come into force, and I believe that Nigeria will be well prepared when that eventually happens. Well, the committee was set up in October last year. It's now three months, so we do hope that the report is imminent. But how much longer can the Nigerian government hold out from joining the continental trade deal, which has been acclaimed as history's largest like fair I trade said. agreement, sorry, with a market size in the region of $3 trillion? Besides, we are the largest economy on the continent, and the deal will provide market access for our goods. It will also force us to improve on our infrastructure and the quality of our products if we want to remain competitive. You've met several points, all of which are valid, but let me remind you what I said earlier. It's not usually how fast, it's how well, right? So I think the way to look at what Nigeria is doing is that Nigeria is trying to do the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement engagement well as opposed to doing it fast and that's a choice people usually make we've made the choice to do it well not to not necessarily to be the first you know like i said it's not necessarily the swift the swift test that, that win the race the second point to make is that that this this set of studies and engagement we're doing now is what will bring those benefits are not automatic you've reeled off several benefits in terms of the size of the market it will create the infrastructure People have to do that, and usually it's done in partnership between business and government. And so the benefit of this engagement is that we can work out strategies on how we will engage as a country, and like you, like you rightly pointed out, we're the biggest player in the, in, the, in the economy, in the continent, and therefore Nigeria doing it well can only benefit not just Nigeria but the entire continent. So I'm, I'm reasonably confident, in fact, I'm highly confident that having gone through a due process, a proper process, to engage on the AFCFT, that the results will bring many, many benefits to Nigeria, like you pointed out. But it will be because we went through this process. Not, um, it wouldn't have been that way if we had not engaged and if we don't continue to engage. Well, let's move on now. You have commenced the revitalization of the moribund textile industry in conjunction with China, with plans to open factories in Katsina, Kano, Abia, and Lagos states. How far along is this process? Again, that's an excellent observation that we're doing a lot to uh, revamp our industries where Nigeria ought to and historically had a, a comparative advantage and even a competitive advantage. And um, textile cotton garments just being one example, or cotton textile garment being one example. So what are we doing? What we're doing is number one, we're creating the industrial infrastructure, which is what led to the, the, you know, the, the sector basically um, becoming moribund, like you pointed out. What is industrial infrastructure? Industrial parks, special economic zones, where you have adequate infrastructure, power, transportation, logistics, and so on. And so the states you mentioned are examples where we're doing that. You know, um, Kanu State, Katsina State, Lagos State, Abia State. We plan to do it in all six geopolitical zones and ultimately in all the states. But those states are examples where we are hoping that um, as we revamp the industrial parks and the special economic zones there, that what you then have is that investors will come in to invest. And by investing, we will have this um, uh, textile sector coming back in a very big and a robust way, and in a much more competitive way. And how are we doing this? We're doing this in partnership with the private sector. I mentioned the example of Rui Group from South Africa. There's also Vlisco, which is a group that is also looking to come and invest in a significant way in, in, um, in the cotton textile garment sector. 
and there are many other players that are looking at it. So this is a model we intend to adopt across board. We want to do the same thing for agri processing, we want to do the same thing for petrochemicals and downstream, we want to do the same thing for the auto sector, we want to do the same thing for all the other sectors where we have uh, the raw materials and ought to be processing them here rather than just exporting raw materials and importing finished goods. Indeed, the Rio Group is bringing in $2 billion to the country, so that's um, some kind of um, positivity. But the Nigeria Industrial Revolution Plan doesn't appear to have gained any traction, and there are no signs of a revolution quite yet. We're not the manufacturing hub of West Africa, neither have we been wind off our dependence on oil. What factors are impeding this process? Well, first, let me say that um, we are gaining traction. When you say the Nigeria Industrial Revolution Plan hasn't gained traction, what, is, what, what does traction mean? Traction means forward movement, right, and steady Progress, movement. Yeah. So if you have a group like Rui investing $2 billion, if that's not traction, you almost have to redefine the word traction, right? $2 billion will cost traction any day. If you establish these special economic zones that you talked about, if that's not traction, then obviously we must be missing the meaning of the word traction. If you start to implement these things, that's how traction happens. Even the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement you talked about, if we implement it successfully, working in partnership with the private sector and have the kind of influence and achieve the results you talked about, then that's traction. I think it's important to understand that when you make a policy, you then have to make, have strategies for implementing that policy. Mm -hmm. the, industrial, uh, the Nigeria Industrial Revolution Plan is a policy. What we have done as a government, and I think history would um, note this um, accurately, is that like we've come and implemented strategies that will realize that policy. Strategies like the, industri like the industrial parks and the special economic zones, strategies like what we did with Nigeria Office for Trade Negotiations and making sure trade is now done properly in Nigeria, strategies like the, what the Nigeria, Indust Nigeria Investment Promotion Commission is doing by targeting particular sectors and countries. We signed an MOU with the Volkswagen you know, for auto. You know, so there are so many examples I can give you. We're doing a new pack for auto in Newi and so on and so forth. So there are several things that are going on that if properly understood and appreciated will represent significant traction on uh, implementing the Nigeria Industrial Revolution Plan. You've highlighted the importance of strategy and policy. So why did you not issue a public rebuttal of Priti Patel's damning assessment of the investment climate in Nigeria? She's the former Secretary of State for International Development in the UK, who warned investors to be wary of investing in Nigeria, citing the Buhari administration's apparent contempt for international law and conventions and court decisions. I think first, it's important to understand that the voice of one individual, even if it's a highly placed individual or somebody who has served in important positions, cannot be taken to mean, you know, just basically the way things are. I mean, the way this particular lady, people cite it as if she's an authority. She's just a mere human being with an opinion. Anybody can say, it's like me saying, I think the US, you know, maybe is not doing things right or any other country for that matter. It doesn't change what the reality on the ground is. And what we have been discussing is what we're doing, which is attracting investment, which is furthering industry. You know, and those things must continue. Dr. You know, Elena, man, the not, this is not. Critics. And it's actually, but it's beyond a mere critic. She's the former Secretary yeah. of Investment, and she was clear in her assessment and that she is fully supportive of foreign investment to developing countries, but not Nigeria. She singled out Nigeria, so she's not a mere critic that you can dismiss. Well, jo ask your... I've been in the investment business for over... I mean, I was going to say over 30 years, right? Um, the fact that one individual says, I think Nigeria is not where you should invest, with all due respect, and I speak as an authority, is an opinion. I stand to be corrected. You can't persuade me that she's more than one individual giving an opinion. And what I'm saying to you is that like, when you look at the totality of the facts, right, then her opinion becomes just the mere opinion of a single individual. And Nigeria will be, you know, we have a proverb where I come from, you know, um, in, uh, in uh, the, the eastern part of the country. It says, a person that is rejected doesn't reject himself. Father, somebody says, you don't know what you're doing, doesn't mean that you don't know what you're doing. Because there's also another saying that says, the man that said something wrong will eventually change his opinion when he sees the result. That same lady, trust me, will change her mind very shortly by the time all these things were rolling out coming to fall. Please don't overweight her opinion, with all due respect. Well, you've talked about your experience in business and your exposure to the private sector. 
On the government of Nigeria website, we noticed that there are 15 parasitters under your ministry. Now, given that track record which you have spoken about, uh, why have you not brought your expertise and experience to bear by rationalizing these agencies as a cost-saving measure that other ministries could learn from? Well, first, let me say that um, we have undertaken several wide-ranging reforms. Time will fail me to walk you through them. But let me just give you some highlights, right? So we basically, we've undertaken reforms in industry, some of which I've shared with you, on trade, on investment, on automation. Uh, let me just use automation as an example, because that's cost-saving. We have helped, um, you know, there's something in my department called the Commercial Law Department that deals with intellectual property, you know, for patents and trademarks. We have automated that. We have streamlined it. People are now getting their trademarks and their patents very quickly. Before we came, it used to be a real problem. You know, we've also worked with MSMEs to provide additional financing for them. I think what you need to do is, what we need to do is to share with you um, <clears throat> something we call our compendium of reforms, the things that have happened in the last three, three and a half years. Uh, going back to the event that happened yesterday with the Presidential Quarterly Business Forum, you know, one of the important feedback that most stakeholders give to us is that like we need to speak up more which is why i'm here today basically when they when they learn about what is going on i would agree with you that we need to communicate more we need to share more of the information of what has gone on but i do believe that we have made several significant changes that over time will be a fruit for nigeria we ask these questions we ask these questions because right now the federal government is looking for ways of implementing the new national minimum wage. And these are, you know, ways of finding resources if you just rationalize your different parastatals and streamline your processes. In order to cut costs and bring yes, down so, the cost I mean, of government. I think you are right. And, and, and remember that what it takes to bring down the cost of government, like we said, is not rocket science, right? It's really around uh, efficiency, automation, and basically trying to do things faster and better. And there is an ongoing effort to do that, and I've just given you some examples. We are also launching uh, something we call an SME portal, a portal that will make it a lot easier for micro, small, and medium enterprises to receive government services and therefore reduce the cost. When it comes to the efforts of the federal government to increase revenues, it's a much more wide-ranging the set of measures that will be required. What we're doing is basically looking across board to say what are the opportunities to fast track some of the reforms that are going on that will basically fast track our revenues as a country, right? Particularly non-oil revenues. And um, I think you'll find that like the work that our technical committee is doing and that the work that this government is doing will turn the minimum wage issue into a blessing in disguise. Because if we do those things well, then obviously we can pay our people better, we can be wealthier as a country, and we can be a more prosperous nation. But the focus surely cannot just be on boosting revenue. No government focuses entirely on that. You also look at ways of cutting costs, reducing wastages, and plugging all the leakages. And I think the work they're doing will cover that. I thought I gave you an example of using automation, but I think just to agree with you, you definitely need to look at the two sides of an equation. Um, one of my, um, in my previous life, I used to be an accountant, and you're right, they're like, uh, surpluses will come from, you know, more input and less output in terms of cost. So you are right to say that uh, we need more revenues and we also need to look at ways to um, streamline our costs and be more efficient. I agree with you on that point. And just before we let you go, it's a new year. The Buhari administration is winding down. What are the priorities for your ministry this year? What should Nigerians be looking forward to from your ministry? I think for us, the most important thing is to consolidate and implement these reforms I've talked about. Like you said, these reforms, unless they're fully implemented, you know, you won't get the results. It's a bit like saying, you know, one is not, you can't be half pregnant, right? You need to finish the work and get the results. So a lot of work is going in to make sure that the work we're do, we've done in industrialization, in investment attraction and promotion, on trade, uh, working with SMEs, uh, automation, and, and so on and so forth, that that work, you know, um, bears fruit. Enabling environment that we talked about, that's how we started the interview. I think it's important to know that, like, government has to continue. But we have a duty in this government is completing this first term that we have, you know, measurable things that we have achieved and things we can hand over in a way that will show reasonable progress for Nigeria. Minister, sir, how competitive and developed is our export industry? Would you say it is thriving? 
I think our export industry has potential. That's what I would say. But I would say that potential has not been fully realized. Let me explain. Any country that is a large country, like Nigeria, you know our population is close to 200 million, faces um, the challenge that there's a tendency to focus inwards because you are, you know, you are big and therefore there's a tendency to want to sort of do business within because there's enough market. Internal market is large. But countries that are this way have to make a deliberate effort and have deliberate strategies to promote export. If not, you find that um, export will tend to suffer. And if anything, you have um, imports, which was a problem we had before this government came. We are just importing everything and exporting close to nothing beyond oil. But what we have done, like I said, one is to revamp and restore the export expansion grant to motivate and incentivize exporters. Um, secondly, if you look at what we are doing in terms of the industrial strategies and the special economic zones, is to make sure that we are more export ready and competitive. In fact, we have a project called Made in Nigeria for Export as a major part of the Special Economic Zones Initiative. What is the idea? To provide industrial infrastructure that will make us competitive. Because really, when it comes to export, the rule of the game is competitiveness. Because you have to have your products being competitive compared to products from other countries. And how do we do that? By providing the industrial infrastructure and the incentives and the fiscal regime you know, for our people to export into other markets. And I think you'll see more of that. Let me close also by saying that some of our large industrialists, like um, um, Dangote Industries, as you know, are making massive investments that will lead to increased exports in non-oil um, areas, um, including sort of what you might call um, um, beneficiation and downstream. You know, I'm sure you're aware of the investments going on in the Lekki Free Trade Zone, where um, and a group like Dangote is investing over $10 billion you know, to invest in fertilizer, in refineries, and in petrochemicals. And in all those areas, those things are for export, not just for the local market. And we're trying to do the same thing in the special economic zones for, uh, like we talked about, cotton earlier and textile. Uh, Rui Group is not coming to spend $2 billion to sell to just Nigeria. They want to sell across Africa and the world. So I think there's a lot that is going on that will boost exports in the years ahead. Mm. Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Dr. Okechuku Enelama. Amen. thanks for being on the show this morning. Thank you for having me.